Hey everybody, this is Christian and today I'm going to show you how I'm from no on handling the authentication for everything in my home lab. Let me introduce you to Authentic, an open source identity provider or shortly called IDP that allows me to securely log into all my administrative services in my home lab like Portainer, Proxmox and even protect web applications with a log and prompt that don't have any form of user management at all. Believe me, this is so incredibly useful. With this setup, I never need to log in twice anymore. I just need to sign in once to Authentic and then I'm automatically logged into everything else. And the best is, because I'm using a strong multi-factor authentication in Authentic, it is even much more secure. Of course, it's well integrated into the entire rest of my home lab setup, like traffic and Docker, so I'm pretty sure if you haven't looked at secure authentication with an IDP before, this is going to change everything for you. So let me show you how I've installed and set up Authentic in my home lab and how you can do this in your environment as well. But wait, before we start, I have another very cool thing I want to show you that's going to help making our home labs much more secure. A big thanks goes out to the people at Waza for supporting this video. Waza is an open source security platform that unifies extended detection and response with a security information and event management system to protect your endpoints and cloud workloads. I'm currently testing this on my own home lab Linux servers and it gives me an in-depth analysis of any security events that occur in my systems, for example when somebody tries to log in via SSH and many many more. It has a huge set of pre-configured rules and checks that constantly collect any of those events on my servers and in the central dashboard I can drill into all of the details, set up alerts and get notified when something bad happens on my systems. And what I personally like the most right now is the security configuration assessment that checks my server's configuration against the CIS benchmark list, which is a set of best practices and security configuration guidelines. And this helps me so much to learn more about secure server configuration and how I can improve the overall security of my home lab services. So it is really an amazing tool. I definitely want to make a dedicated video about it at some point, but if you'd like to have a look or you want to use it within your own environment to secure and protect your devices, then check out Waza. I'll leave you a link in the description of this video. Now let's get back to topic and talk about secure authentication. Okay, so first of all, as always, let us take a closer look at the official homepage goauthentic.io where we can learn more about this application. And as you can see, this is an open source identity provider that focuses on flexibility and versatility. It aims to replace existing directory services like Active Directory or Okta with a unified a platform that simplifies the login, sign up and recovery process for both your external users and team members in one unified identity management platform. What exactly that means, we'll cover in a few minutes. So I know this can get quite complex because Authentic is a real beast. It has tons and tons of features such as SAML2, OAuth2, OpenID Connect, LDAP and radios. So that means Authentic can work as your radios or LDAP server. And it has a lot of compelling features like multi-factor authentication, conditional access. It is open source and has an application proxy integrated. The only thing that it doesn't do is device authentication support. But as you can see, none of the other competitors do in a good way either. <laughs> at least that's what Authentic is going to tell us. Authentic has a rich documentation about all those different provider settings, the configuration, the installation and architecture. I could just recommend to go through some of the pages, such as the architecture page, which describes more of the core components of this platform. And also the terminology page is really interesting because it explains some of this uh, technical concepts and terminologies that Authentic uses in their platform. And I have to be honest with you guys, so first, uh, once I had a look at this platform, I was a bit confused about all those different terminologies and this authentication specific jargon, yeah, such as what is an application, what is a provider policy, what the heck is an outpost. And I just decided to just go and set it up once and try it out. So I went through a lot of trial and error process until it finally clicked and I understood, okay, so this is how this platform functions. So that's why I try to keep it simple in this tutorial so you don't have to worry about all of this stuff yourself. So let's go and let's start installing Authentic on one of my demo servers. 
I'm just going to open a connection to my server demo one where I have already installed Docker and Docker Compose. By the way, if you're not familiar with Docker and uh, you haven't worked with this before, you definitely should check out my Patreon course about Docker. It is still a work in progress, but it is entirely free for you to watch. So I will link you that in the description down below. Okay, so I'm going to create another directory which is called authentic demo one and CD into this directory and I'm just opening a remote connection to this server in Visual Studio Code. So this is how we can better work with those uh, configuration files. So let's open the folder in here as well. Uh, let's go back to the documentation and go to the installation page. As you can see, you can install it in many different ways, such as on Kubernetes clusters, with automated installed or reverse proxy integration. For me personally, I found it to be the most useful way to install it in Docker Compose and integrate it with my reverse proxy traffic. Uh, so here we can just uh, follow these instructions. Authentic already has a Docker Compose file generated that you can use as a template and customize it to your needs. That's exactly what we're going to do. So I will just download this file here and upload it on my remote server. I'm just going to rename the file type and remove the version uh, string at the beginning. We actually don't need that. As you can see, there's a lot of pre-configured stuff in here that I'm going to change and customize it to my needs. So you don't have to follow all the same steps like I do. You basically can just go deploy it and it will automatically install and deploy authentic with a self-signed certificate and exposes on the port 9000 and 9004 for free. However, because I've already installed traffic as a reverse proxy on this Docker server, I'm going to integrate it. And uh, this is also pretty useful because we later can then protect other web services that are exposed via the traffic reverse proxy and protect it with a login prompt in Authentic. So this is then in the end all well integrated, uh, but just to know, so you can follow a different type of setup process if you're not using traffic or you're using something else. Okay, so the first uh, thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, this Docker Compose project to my uh, networks that I'm using. So on this Docker server, I already have a front end network. So I'm going to add this to the file and a backend network. So we can attach the Docker containers to those two networks here. The Docker Compose file consists of four different services, the server component, the worker component, and two database components. The Redis database is a fast cache database, and the Postgres SQL database is a database that actually contains the data about the users, the configuration, and so on. And I'm also adding the worker component to the backend, uh, but the user facing application, so that actually exposes the dashboard of Authentic, I'm going to add to the front end network as well. Okay, so all of these containers should be connected to the same network backend, and uh, the front end network should be connected with the traffic reverse proxy. And now I'm also going to add a container name because I just like my containers to have uh, named in the same style. So I'm just going to give it the name of the project, Postgres SQL, for example, and I'm going to copy this and I'm going to do the same for Redis, for the server and for the worker process as well. Now that we have this, um, I want to manage the environment variables in a slightly different way because I, I don't, I just don't like this formatting and the style and I want to have all those environment variables later in one .env file that only contains the necessary credentials and not too much other information. As you can see, they use a, a bunch of different uh, environment variables for the image name or the image tagging. So I'm going to remove all of this here. Um, first of all, I'm going to add a different formatting to the environment variables. You can you can use any format that you like, so you, you don't have to use my um, formatting style, but I, I just feel much more comfortable with this one here. And I'm just going to rename the environment variables exactly as the same that is passed through in the container. So I think this is much more readable. And then we can start formatting the server environment variables as well. Note um, those double underscores here. These are really important. Just refer to the official documentation. So it is important that you keep it this way. 
And um, we also need to define two more variables here. According to the documentation, you can enable the error reporting by setting this environment variable. So we are also going to do that. And we're also going to need one more environment variable for the authentic secret key. So this is a secret key that is used to um, encrypt the database. You need to make sure that this is not exposed in any way. So this is really, really important. Now we can basically copy those variables here and set it for the worker process as well. We don't need those comments here. And the env file statement we can also remove. So I'm also going to modify or remove the environment variables from the image tag. We will use a pinned tagged version, which is always uh, the recommended way. So don't use just the latest tag, use one specific version and then I do those uh, updates manually. Uh, the server and the worker process is by the way using the same Docker image. So don't be confused by this, but it's actually started with a different command. So the command for starting the worker process and another command for starting the server. Okay, perfect. So I think we can create the .env file so that contains all the secrets. Remember we just had the environment variables for the database configuration, such as the database name, the user, and a secure password, which ideally should not be test, 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 but I'm just doing a demo here, so I'll, I'll be fine, right? And we also need the authentic secret key. And to generate the secret key, we'll have to go back to the documentation. And as you can see, you can use uh, this command here, the open SSL command to generate a new random key. So that's what I'm going to do right now. Copy this secret. Of course, as I said, don't expose this one and paste it in here as well. Okay, great. So now we have the .env file that contains the secrets and the Docker compose file. Uh, one thing that uh, might be worth noting is if you want to have an email configuration, it is optional, but it is of course recommended. You can also set those environment variables and set it to your server and worker process to send uh, error notifications or configure email credentials and all those type of things. I'm not going to do it in this demo here right now, but yeah, if you're using this in a production environment, you definitely should configure this. Okay, great. So now we could basically just start and use it with the integrated proxy service of Authentic. But as I said in the beginning, I want to integrate Authentic to my existing reverse proxy setup with traffic. If you are new to traffic, you don't know what this is about and how to install and set it up on Docker or on Kubernetes. Uh, of course, I've made tutorials about this. so I'm going to link you that in the description as well. So go check out traffic. It's really a great reverse proxy that works perfectly together with Docker and also Kubernetes. So it's definitely my, my favorite application. And because this is already running here, we want to expose the authentic services, so the web service, via the traffic labels and not directly through the pod. Because if you're using traffic, you can make sure that you are protecting the authentic services or web services with a trusted SSL certificate that is managed in the traffic reverse proxy and you don't have to use the authentic self-signed certificate. Okay, so we don't need to expose these ports anymore. Instead, we want to add the labels for traffic. So I'm going to add another uh, section here that is called labels. And this first uh, will enable traffic to look for this container and try to expose it. I'm going to copy uh, some of the labels that I've prepared. Uh, but basically what this is about, it, it will create a new router for this domain here. So this is the authentic... Uh, I'm, I'm going to change the uh, evaluation, of course, to demo, right? Uh, but uh, then Authentic will be exposed on this subdomain here on my server demo one. It will use a trusted TLS connection. It will try to issue a new certificate using my Cloudflare certificate resolver. And it is also important that you have to configure the service port. So the internal service port of the traffic web service. Remember, this was using port 9000. Uh, so we have to configure this as well. So the traffic reverse proxy knows what servers it should connect to. That should be all. So now we can start running the server. And of course, you can go into the project directory here. You can uh, do a docker compose up, dash d in the background and so on. But I'll do it in VS Code. I think this is the most simple way to do it on a remote server. So just fire up the docker up command. As you can see, it's now putting down the latest image for the authentic pin tagged version that we have configured here. So the version 2024 2.2 .2 is currently running the deployment process or the initial 
a deployment process of Authentic. So it starts creating some database entries and so on. Of course, that might take a few minutes, so it's tea time. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So a server deployment has been completed. So let's check if everything was successful. So let's open the subdomain that I've uh, configured in traffic, authenticdemo1.serverdemo1.home.crgrave.de. And yep, so it all worked. Whoa, first, first try it did work. So I'm a little proud of myself. Yeah. <laughs> And now we can start logging in. So Authentic by default does not have any default password. It only has a default administrative user, which is called the AK admin. To start the initial setup, we have to navigate to this URL here. So we have to use the server's IP or host name. The port we don't need because we have exposed it on the 4 for free port using traffic. And now we have to set an admin email address. So this is always required. I'm just adding my uh, business uh, address in here and use a strong password for the default administrator account. There is no configuration here. Of course, we haven't configured any application or so, but if you would log in with a user to Authentic, you would see all the different applications. So later you will see my Proxmox server, my, my Portainer web interface and so on in here. And if you want to switch to the admin interface, click here. This will take you to the administrator login account. So uh, there you can see all the different uh, statistics like the synchronization status. If all services are online, you can also see the logins or authorizations if there are any failed logins or successful logins to one of those services here. And on the left side, you will find the menu for configuring the applications that provide us the outpost. Again, look at the terminology page if you don't understand one of those things here. But anyway, I will walk you through the process. After doing the initial setup, there are a few things uh, recommended by Authentic to secure the platform. And of course, I don't want to use the AK admin account for my regular user account. As you can see, it has this default username and you cannot really change it. What I want to do is I want to keep it like the default admin, but I want to create a new user for myself that I want to protect with a multi-factor authentication and I'll make this the new administrator account. And how you can do this, how you can create new users, um, you just go to the directory uh, tab here. By the way, you can also set up the groups, the roles, um, the permissions and all of this stuff in this menu here. I'm not going through all of the details here. So I'm focusing more on the uh, initial setup that, you, that you're going to need. So I'm going to add my, my username in here. What is the user type? It is an internal user or external user service account whatsoever. I'm also going to give it my uh, business email address in here. Of course, the user is active and it's in this default path user. So that should be fine. Let's create it. Specify a password here. So let's click on this user, set a password. So I'm going to click on this user here, click on group, and now we can add it to an existing group, which is the authentic administrator group. So this will make my new user account the administrator for authentic. Okay, great. So now that we have this, we can set up a strong multi-factor authentication for this user. So let's log out and log in with my new username and password. As you can see, it automatically uh, catches my avatar icon from Gravatar. So it's also pretty cool. You have to set up the email address for this and configure your avatar in the Gravatar service. And uh, now in this user interface in here, when we go to this uh, settings menu, there we can now set up multi-factor authentication devices. And then you can uh, enroll web authentication devices. So if you want to use passwordless authentication with pass keys or a hardware token or anything like this, or a TOTP, so one-time password device, which is pretty useful. So you have to scan this QR code with an authenticator device, such as your phone, use Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, or Authy, just like what is your favorite authentication service, and then enter the one time password code from your phone, click on continue, and then your multi-factor authentication device is now configured. Let's log in again with my username or my email address. And now it uh, prompts us to use a one of our auth multi-factor authentication device, the hardware token or the traditional authenticator. With 
So let's enter this and now we are successfully logged in. So what is also recommended, let's go to the admin interface and go back into the directory service. As you can see, we now have our new user and still the default AK admin user, which we actually don't need anymore. So it's definitely recommended to deactivate this user so that no one is able to log in with this default admin user that might not have a second factor anymore. Okay, amazing. So we now have set up Authentic. We have exposed it using trusted TLS certificates in the traffic reverse proxy. And we also created another user with a strong multi-factor authentication. So now that we have this central user management platform, we can all start connecting all those different services in my home lab to enable a secure authentication against Authentic. What type of services you know want to connect with Authentic is of course very much depending on your own personal setup and requirements. So you might have different systems and platforms than I have. Um, if you want to find out what exactly you can uh, connect with Authentic, just go to integration. So here you will find a list of applications that are known to work with Authentic. However, of course, because all those protocols are standardized, like OAuth, OpenID Connect, LDAP, and so on, you could connect actually basically any service and platform that supports one of those providers. You can configure an authentic. So there are basically thousands of uh, applications that might work with it. However, in this list, you can very easily find out so what type of support level those applications might have. For example, if you go to hypervisors and orchestrators, you can find Rancher in here which is a, an enterprise platform for managing Kubernetes environments. And this has a support level of Authentic. So it's officially supported by Authentic. Uh, others might have a community level support such as Portana and Proxmox. And I want to show you those two examples because they use two different types of protocols you have to configure in Authentic. And I also found it to be the most simple and useful for me personally in my home lab. As you might know, I'm using Proxmox to run all my virtual machines and Portana to manage my Docker containers. Uh, but just go through this list here. You will find many, many more just like Grafana. We have covered it in a, in a video before. Uh, Uptime Kuma. I also made a video about Zabbix. I know this is still on my list. I have to do a video about it. At some day, I'll probably do this. It's not in the near future, but at some point, I'll probably take a look at this as well. So yeah, just go through it. You will find so many, many uh, cool services that are supported in here. So for example, I'm running a Portana web server on the exact same server where I can manage my containers. But of course, I always have to log in with a separate username and password to get access to the Portana web interface. So let's start connecting Portana to my authentic platform. Basically, you just have to follow this documentation here for any service that you want to connect. But let us run through this together, right? So let's first of all go to Authentic and open the Applications tab and go to Providers. We always need one provider and one application to connect as a separate service with the Authentic platform. And we'll start with creating another one in here. So now we can select what type of provider we want to connect. That is now very much depending on the other application that you want to connect. If it's using LDAP authentication, if it's using OAuth or OpenID, proxy, radios, whatever. Um, as you can see in the documentation, so Portana is using the OAuth and OpenID provider. So we're going to select this one here and click on next. So now we need to give it a name such as Portana Demo 1. I'll just uh, call it the same like the subdomain so I can uh, always better remember so what type of service, uh, so what is the actual application interface. And in the authorization flow, we now can select two separate options here. We can use the explicit consent or the implicit consent. So the consent means that when you are successfully logged in, uh, using Authentic uh, to the Portainers platform that you have to click on consent so that it redirects you to the actual application. If you're choosing implicit, this consent is automatically done. You don't need to do that all the time. Explicit, you always have to uh, give your consent to open, uh, to authorize the other application. So I'm using explicit to show you the consent prompt that shows up. Now it's important that uh, you have these protocol settings here, like the client type, the client ID, the client secret, uh, which is signing key. Of course, it's using the self-signed certificate. You can also configure uh, advanced protocol settings like uh, for how long is the access token valid and so on. So usually you don't need to change those type of things here. 
Uh, following this documentation, you have to copy the client ID and save it for later and the client secret as well. And the redirection your URIs you have to specify in here. So let's let's do that. I'm just copying this here. By the way, this is not like a one-time password. You can always look it up later if you like. And here in the redirection URLs, we have to use this one here. So the URL where it should redirect us to. And let's click on finish. So now that we have the provider, we now would need to create an application. But according to the documentation, we first need to log in to Portana and go to settings, authentication. And now we can choose an authentication method other than internal. So that means like internal user management in Portana and select OAuth and also use single sign on. Uh, what you can also, or what you should also enable is automatic user provisioning. So when you enable this here, um, that means that a user in Portana is automatically created when you logged in successfully to Authentic. If you don't want this, so if you still want to create the users manually in Portana, you need to disable this, but it is actually one of the whole reasons why I'm using this system. So I definitely don't want to uh, provision the users myself. So let's enable this. And now because those uh, other features are all business features, we have a custom provider, of course, which is authentic. And here are the settings where you have to put in the uh, client ID and secret. So that, that I just copied. So this is the client ID. This is uh, the secret. And now we need to go back to the documentation. It actually tells us exactly what we need to fill in. Of course, you need to replace authentic company with the fully qualified domain name of authentic. So for example, let's do that once together for the authorization URL. And we have to replace this year with authentic demo one server demo one home.cgrape.de. And basically do the same for all the other entries. <laughs> So here we need to pay attention actually because uh, this URL, uh, if you go to the documentation, uses the name Portana. So this is the name of the application. So that has to match um, the name that we give to this application later. So you can use Portana if you're using a different name. You need to make sure that you're using this different name in the URL in here. So in my case, for example, Portana uh, demo one, yeah. And also the user identify now can be the username or the email address. So, so depending on what you want, you can select username. I'm preferring the username in here and not the email address. Okay, let's just add the scope. You should not forget those. And then let's click on save settings. All right, perfect. So these are all the settings required in Portana. We now need to follow step three, which is create an application which uses this provider. So again, Every provider in Authentic needs to have an application as well. So let's go to application, click on create. Uh, remember, I've used the name Portana Demo 1 and I'm using the same slug in here. Now we need to select a provider, which is our OAuth provider Portana Demo 1. And that's basically everything we need. So let's click on create. Okay, so now that we have the application and the provider, if we now go to the user interface, you should see a new application in here, which is called Portana Demo 1. So in the settings of the application, you could also change the icon, the name, and those uh, type of things. But if we click on that, it will take us to the Portana page. And now we have a new button, which is called Login with OAuth. So we still could use the internal authentication with admin user and password. But of course, we want to use our user configured in Authentic. So let's click on Login with or off. And as you can see, this is the consent that I meant with explicit consent we have configured. If you've used implicit content, it should automatically redirect you to this application. So let's click on continue. And now it's logging in us to Portana. Awesome. So that's everything. As you can see, we don't see anything here in Portana right now because we're not logged in with the admin user anymore. We are uh, logged in now with my authentic user. And this authentic user, of course, does not have any administrative privileges in Portana automatically. So this is what you always have to do on the separate system. Of course, you have to configure the permissions or the privileges on the separate system to those users that Authentic has automatically created. So we need to log out once more, log back into Portana Demo 1 and use the internal authentication again. 
a login. And if we now go to users, you can see that there is a new user created. So it's using the user identifier. If you have configured the uh, email address in here, you should see your new user with your email address instead of the username, by the way. You also see the authentication is not internal. Uh, instead, it's OAuth. And now we can click on the user and make it an administrator as well. So now let's log out and log in again with OAuth. By the way, I just want to show you what happens when you log out from Authentic. Yeah, so now we are not logged into Authentic anymore. And if I now would go and open the Portana web interface, log in with OAuth, it would first prompt us to securely authenticate to Authentic first before it redirects us to the Portana admin interface. So let's do that. I also need to authenticate with my multi-factor authentication, of course. And only then I'm automatically logged in and redirected to Portana. Okay, so let's do another example. I want to show you how to connect Proxmox to Authentic. Because again, in Proxmox, I have to log in with a separate user, with a separate password. So let's also connect those two platforms. Just follow the same documentation again. Just like with Portana, we need to go to Authentic and create another provider in the Applications Provider tab. So let's create this one. We select the same provider, just like with Portainer, OAuth slash OpenID. And here is all of the uh, confidential information like client ID, secret, and so on. I just need to add the redirection URL. So in this case, it is um, the, this URL here. Note the absent of the trailing slash here and that you need to include the port number as well because Proxmox interface is using a different port than any web interface here. So now we need to go to Proxmox and uh, set up those type of things here. You can you, uh, do it in the UI. You could also execute this command here in the CLI of Proxmox. But of course, uh, I'm using the UI. It's, it's simpler. So you have to go to Data Center and then go to Realms under the Permissions tab and add a new Realm choosing the OpenID Connect server. So I'm just going to use the same fully qualified domain name. And again, the application Proxmox here in my case, I will name PRX Production 2. So the realm, you can set any name. I'll just send it to authentic and paste in the client ID from the provider settings. And the same for the client secret. Now the username claim, you can set to the username or to the email address. Again, same just like with uh, Portainer. You can also make it the default so that it automatically uh, selects this in the login screen of uh, Proxmox. Ah, I forgot to add this here, the autocrate user. Of course, we need to enable this, otherwise the new user, which is authenticated in Authentic, is not created on Proxmox. And again, we need an application, so let's go. PX Production 2, the slug is the same. And now we want to select our Proxmox provider, and that's it. Okay, so let's uh, hope this will work. <laughs> go to the user interface and go to Proxmox. You can now select the realm to authentic. Log in with OpenID Connect. Again, same thing as with Portainer. We don't have any permissions in uh, Proxmox. So we need to log out and log in again with our administrative user. And go to data center again. And now click on permissions tab. Now we can add... Um, uh, permissions for the user. So you should find it in here. So let's just click uh, the root path. And now you should have the uh, username at and then the name of the realm, in our case, authentic. And we just give it the role administrator, propagate. Click on add. And now when we log out again, log in using OpenID Connect. And now you can see I'm logged in with my authentic user, but I now have access to any administrative privileges on my Proxmox server. Honestly, I think this is really amazing. I can now simplify the login procedure on basically any administrative web service in my home lab. I'm just gonna show you one more thing because I promised you in the beginning to show you how to protect any web application that you expose using a reverse proxy like traffic with an authentic login, even though the application doesn't have any form of user management at all. And I know the video is already pretty long. As you can see, I'm really exhausted. My tea is already empty, but I'm going to show you that as well because I think this is really cool. So let's, uh, let's do one more example. Let's assume I wanna protect a simple web application just like this Nginx web 
web server with a login prompt using my authentic provider. Of course, this static web page doesn't have any form of user management at all, so it doesn't support OAuth or OpenID, but I still can protect it when it's using the same reverse proxy on the same server where Authentic is running. No, this has to be the same server now. As you can see, Authentic comes with its own proxy provider, but you can also integrate other ones using the forward authentication. So the way how this works is, when the user does the initial request to the reverse proxy, the reverse proxy first checks if the user is authenticated. If it is not, it will redirect it to the authentic login page. And only if the user is successfully authenticated, it will forward the initial request to the actual service and sends the response back to the user's device. You can use the forward authentication with yeah, all types of reverse proxies that supports forward auth, such as the Nginx web server. So this will also work with Nginx and also Nginx proxy manager, by the way. Traffic, which is my favorite reverse proxy. I probably told you a couple of times there, yeah, but I can't tell you enough. <laughs> and also Caddy. I know many, many uh, people in our community love Caddy for whatever reason. Yeah, maybe one day you'll convince me, but for now I'm still in the traffic uh, fan team. <laughs> So I'm going to use this. There are a couple of steps involved that you have to do. You have to configure a middleware and you have to configure your web app that you are exposing using traffic to use this middleware so that it's actually redirected to the authentic platform. So let's go back to my Visual Studio Code instance. So I'm not going to need this here anymore. So here I'm running the Docker Compose file for this Nginx web server. You can see this is exposed using the Nginx evaluation one uh, subdomain on the server demo one. So these are the traffic labels. And there's also the traffic reverse proxy running. This is uh, this year. In the traffic configuration file, I've added a new file provider to watch the directory, etc. traffic slash conf, which is located on the host in this directory. So any YAML configuration file for traffic, such as this headers.yaml, will automatically be loaded into the dynamic config of traffic. And this is exactly where we can put the sample configuration for the middleware in. So let's just paste it. We just need to change one thing and it is the address for the outpost. And this has to match the internal uh, container name of the authentic server. So that's also the reason why in the authentic Docker Compose file, I've configured the server with the container name authentic demo one server, because we can now just copy this name and paste it as the server address. So that's also important. You have to put the traffic reverse proxy in the same Docker network. Now we can just go to the uh, reverse proxy and add a new label in here, which is traffic router middleware and set it to authentic. So this name needs to match the name of the middleware you have configured here. Of course, we need to take the Nginx web server down and restart it so that the new label is attached to the container. But we also have to go into Authentic because if we refresh the page, you can see this is not working. So we have to go into Authentic once more, go to the admin page and first create a new provider for it. So let's click on create. And now we are not using the OAuth OpenID provider. We are using the proxy provider. So we're giving it a name, Nginx evaluation one. The authentication flow is explicit and we're using the forward authentication for a single application. The external host is the URL of the web server, of course. And that's it for the provider settings. So now we need to go into the application, create an application for it, just like with all of the other providers, select the provider, in our case, proxy provider, and let's click on create one more thing to do. We have to go to Outpost and go to the Authentic Embedded Outpost, click on Edit and select our Nginx Evaluation application to be picked up by the Embedded Outpost. Click on Update. Okay, so now let us open a new private window where I'm not logged into Authentic and do another web request to the Nginx web server. As you can see, this automatically redirects us to the login page of Authentic. So we first of all need to successfully authenticate to Authentic and log in with our one-time password to get access to the actual website of Nginx. So this is so amazing. And with this way, you can really protect any form of website or web page with a secure login prompt, no matter if it has a user authentication service or not.
I really like this so much. Okay, guys, so this is everything I wanted to show you today. This is how you can simplify and centralize the authentication process in your entire home lab. Of course, there are so many other open questions I have. For example, what about LDAP and how can I authenticate other LDAP services like TrueNAS or my Sophos XG firewall using Authentic or how do I deploy Authentic to Kubernetes and connect my other traffic deployments? All these questions I'm currently trying to figure out and of course, you can be sure I'm making a follow-up video on this. And please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you're up for future episodes about Authentic or about HomeLab or any other tech topics for IT professionals. A big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. You guys are really amazing. And thanks everyone for watching. I'll catch you in the next episode. Take care. Bye-bye.